Uh, of course, I'm really happy to be here at um, uh, FOSS Asia. And we're going to be talking about databases at scale. This isn't really just about Redis and Postgres. Both are great databases. But it's also about how we have to think about databases when we're operating above certain thresholds. Um, and we're going to talk about how that changes as our databases get big and busy, and also how Redis and Postgres are very different from each other. So um, basically, I have a bunch of experience with Postgres and actually a bunch of experience with Redis. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much here for lack of time, but uh, I've worked with Postgres for 24 years, and I've probably worked with Redis for maybe six or seven years. Um, as I say, they're both, they're both good databases. I like them both, but um, they're also very different, and there are a bunch of misunderstandings that people have about both of them when it comes to scale. So um, I wanted to thank, in particular, uh, Adjust, where my case study came from. Uh, I used to work there, and what, uh, we actually moved a bunch of Redis stuff to Postgres, specifically for scaling reasons. Um, and uh, also, well, when I used to work at Delivery Hero, we had cases where we were looking at Redis and Postgres uh, together in certain environments, and um, the, you know asking questions about when is it appropriate to use these. So that that comes in really important. Uh, really, um, uh, that was really helpful in kind of developing my ideas on this. Um, and then, of course, uh, representing Oriol DB here. Um, I'm you know, working with them on, on this, and actually this whole slide deck and presentation came out of collaboration that I started with them, uh, what, uh, some months ago, um, where the question was, what can we do to make Postgres able to um, replace Redis in some cases? I don't think we, you know, I wouldn't say you're ever going to replace it in all cases, but the, then this gets into the question of what's, what's good about each system and what's bad about each system. Um, so, uh, for our agenda day, we're going to talk a lot about databases at scale. Uh, then we'll have a quick tour through both um, Redis and Postgres in terms of their basic architecture. And we'll talk about how these are affected by um, volume and velocity of data. Okay, Because both of those are things which can impact scalability in both cases. And um, so we'll, we'll look at those carefully. Um, we'll, we'll discuss the case study, and we'll talk about why at Adjust, when I was there, we moved all these Redis systems into Postgres. Um, and uh, it'll become very, very clear um, as, as we go through the architectural um, side why that was the case. We'll, we'll talk about, like, some common solutions to using uh, one or both together, and uh, finally, some general recommendations. So first, databases at scale. So basically, there are a large number of things that people believe about running databases at scale that tend not to actually match the experiences that we have when we get there. So, um, of course, different levels of scale are different, and we'll talk about that, right? But people sometimes say, I've heard this many times, Redis is faster, it scales easier, et cetera. This may or may not be true depending on what exactly you're doing, okay? Similarly, if you're at a point where you have to scale out Postgres, there may, may be some solutions that might help you with that, or you can probably afford to hire people who know what they're doing to make it happen. Um, so th th that's basically the overall motivation of this talk. And then the question is, um, what, um, how we use the tools that we have in these cases. So first thing I really want to drill home here is how we use databases changes as they get big and as they get busy, okay? And um, I'm willing to bet, you know, like, at least when I started working with databases, I started with some toy databases, like less than a gigabyte in size, 
And eventually, through my career, I've worked in Postgres databases that were 170 terabytes. Um, in these different environments, you end up thinking about your data and your database very, very differently, right? And so where we start in our careers and where we can end up as we scale can be very, 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 very different. So I'm going to basically go through a few sizes here. And we're going to talk about how every time we increase the database by a factor of 10, some of our considerations may change, okay? First one is database under one gigabyte, right? Who cares about indexing? Who cares about how efficient your SQL is? Who cares about what the planner does, right? You write a query and it comes back almost instantly unless you do something really, 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 really stupid because um, all the data fits in memory. You can sequentially scan through a gigabyte of data really fast, right? So. Um, at one gigabyte, typically we want to focus on learning how to do things correctly, make sure our data is properly normalized, and you know all the very basic things that you know we we would learn from a purely mathematical perspective. We can look at the database here as just a math engine and nothing else, right? When we get to ten gigabytes, you know storage starts to matter a little bit because not all the data is going to stay in memory usually, unless you have a lot of memory. Um, you're typically going to want to think about indexes because even if you have it in memory, sequentially scanning through 10 gigabytes of data is going to take a bit longer. Um, and, you know, if you're writing a really crazy reporting query that, say, processes, like, 5 gigabytes of data, like, 20 times, in order to get one report, that's going to perform badly, and you're going to have to start thinking about how on earth you are going to write this better. So query efficiency starts to matter here a little bit, and indexes start to matter just a little bit. Um, but usually, I mean, st while storage can matter a little bit, it's usually not a big concern. When you get to 100 gigabytes, storage starts to matter a bit more. You need to be pretty good at indexes by the time you get up here, right? Um, you need to understand what the index is, how it's, what it's doing, how to make it work, and you're probably going to have to start tuning your, your database here for performance, right? At 10 gigabytes, what tuning do you need to do, right? At 100 gigabytes, you're probably going to have to tune some things. One terabyte. Okay. So one terabyte, we've typically gotten really good in indexing already. We don't have new indexing problems. Performance is going to be much more about storage and access patterns, and we're going to have to start to think in terms of these lower levels. And we're going to start to face problems that were a little easier in lower levels. For example, um, I usually find that um, you know, if your database is 100 gigabytes in size, certain approaches to backups work very nicely. But when you get to a terabyte, then they start becoming really, really, really difficult. And so, you know, you may have to switch what, what tools you're using for backups here. You may have to rethink how you're doing backups. Um, so a lot of these administration things become a lot harder when you go from 100 gigabytes to 1 terabyte. So when you go from 1 terabyte to 10 terabytes, what happens? Um, so by the time you get to 10 terabytes, um, typically um, you're starting to have to reason about the internals of the database on almost everything you're doing, right? The database is no longer a black box. It is a very transparent set of working um, equipment that you actually have to use as working equipment. So internals matter a lot, and you'll, you'll run up against them. And by the time you get to 10 terabytes, there are no longer any kinds of new kinds of problems that you will face as you grow, because you're up against the limits of your hardware, and you're up against the limits of the software. So you know, 10 terabytes to 100 terabytes, same set of problems. So basically, early on, um, we think about databases as black boxes. Internals don't matter. 
and we don't really have to worry about performance tuning, right? Um, costs are straightforward, et cetera, but as, as, as things grow, we start to have to think very carefully about internals. We have to, um, we have to work our way around the hardware. We have to think about the hardware. A lot of these other things become really, really important. So I'm just going to go quickly through a case study um, why we moved some systems from Redis to Postgres. Uh, this was a big ad tech environment. We had a large number of very big Redis servers. I think it was somewhere around 20, if I remember right. Each Redis server was probably running 10 instances of Redis. And it was a really complicated setup with Nutcracker and um, Sentinel. Uh, I guess with newer versions of Redis, you have the clustering stuff that might help a little bit but it was a massive, massive headache. Uh, it was to the point where we couldn't work on the servers reasonably well because we didn't have complete confidence that if you had a Sentinel failover, it would fail over all the right things with uh, Nutcracker and so forth. Um, so like touching that was terrifying. Um, and so, you know, the question is how did we get there and why did we move it? Um, so another major reason to move besides the administrative headache was the fact that Redis hardware is more expensive than Postgres hardware, right? Redis has to have everything in memory. Postgres puts everything on disk. Um, but the, the other big issue is that like this big Redis art infrastructure was brittle. And what had happened just to quickly um, describe the history of this is that the first uh, minimum uh, sort of proof of concept that they had written way back when they started was in MongoDB and, and Node.js. Then they discovered MongoDB didn't scale the way they needed it to and neither did Node.js, so they switched to Redis and Golang, and that worked for a while, and then they moved some things from Redis to Aerospike and some things from Redis to Postgres, and then eventually we got rid of most of the Redis and, and moved almost everything to Postgres. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about Redis's internals so that it makes a little more sense why we did this move. So Redis is a main memory database, but it has a very specific um, characteristic. Uh, it has a very specific architectural decision to make it go really fast on small workloads. It is a single-threaded event loop. There is no concurrency, and there is no ability to run queries in parallel on the same Redis instance. Newer versions can do disk I/O with threads, but they cannot do, um, but they still cannot serve requests with threads because that's all the critical section. Okay, what this means is, if you saturate that event loop, it just cannot go any faster, right? It can't go any faster. So Redis goes one speed only, and you cannot throw hardware at it to make it go faster. Okay. Um, persistence is optional. That becomes important if you're doing queues and stuff. Um, and replication is more or less um, uh, replication is more or less um, similar to Postgres in the sense that there's effectively a binary set of changes that get distributed and, and applied. So. It is possible to write Lua scripts. I have not done this and I have not evaluated how it affects this particular architectural thing. I think the Lua scripts run uh, outside, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, if that's the case, then it would be a little less irritating than if they run in process and can starve everything else. So I mentioned persistence. The big thing about replication is you're replicating writes. And that also has to go through the single threaded event loop. So if you saturate an instance with writes, it will saturate every instance with writes across all of your uh, replicas. So writes compete with reads, and they will compete with reads. Uh, uh, every, a single write will compete with reads across every replica in your in your uh, uh, of, of the same uh, Redis database. Um, so I mentioned no parallelism, easy to saturate, things like that. Um, 
So typically, as, as people get really, uh, as things grow with Redis, then you typically set things up with Nutcracker. Um, I guess now they have the clustering stuff that should make some of this a little easier. The, the issue is if every replica has to have the same memory allocation, so if you're trying to scale up, you're scaling out within a single box, which means more memory. Um, and uh, typically what I've had to do in the past has been Sentinel and, 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 and Nutcracker, and that gets really complicated really quickly. So quickly describe Postgres. Uh, I, assume how many, I assume people here mostly know it relatively well. It's multi-process, it's not multi-threaded. So every backend gets its own uh, query. This makes it much slower to start up and it has a much higher latency, but you can run many more queries in parallel and you can scale it up easily within the same box. Now, if you have to scale it out, now you have to write your own tooling or you have to use uh, systems that may not be built for what you're doing. Um, usually, many people start writing their own tooling in those cases. So, um, so it scales up, it doesn't scale out so well. Um, Postgres is persistent by default. It is possible to maybe um, uh, make it not persistent. You could throw things on RAM disk, for example. Don't do that. Um, uh, replication is tied to the persistence. So if you get rid of persistence, like for an unlogged logged table and try to put it in a RAM disk, um, uh, it won't replicate. And you have many, 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 many options for replication. There's logical replication. Uh, we heard about Spock. Um, and you can build some really complicated things there. So compared to Redis, uh, Postgres is um, slower per core, uh, and it's higher latency. And this is never, ever going to change, right? Because the architectural decisions mandate that. But Postgres scales uh, up much, much easily, much more easily than Redis does and much more cheaply than Redis does, okay? And um, at scale, Postgres is just a lot simpler to manage, right? So in many cases, if you don't need one or the other, you know, if you're centralizing everything, you may find it much, much easier to, to, to put things on, on, on Postgres in many cases. But um, at massive scale, you've still got to write all of your own um, sharding pieces. So costs are usually less. I've mentioned that. Um, uh, I'm going to skip over the scenario again. This is this is the case study. Had massive amounts of Nutcracker, massive amounts of Sentinel, and just the complexity of dealing with a failover was very, 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 very high. Redis can work very well as a cache. Um, so there's even a process. There's even a project that'll read your logical replication stream from Postgres and put it into Redis as a cache. That gets rid of cache invalidation problems. So in the case where you need that, it's great. Also, Redis has this time to live, which is really, 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 really helpful. So in the event where you can leverage the time to live, Redis can in fact be a really, really good uh, alternative. So Postgres um, also can work as a key value store. There are tons of ways of doing this. You can also store a lot of other things. Uh, replacing Redis as a queue, like with, uh, with the list types and pushing and pulling, uh, pushing and popping, is not as good, right? Um, so if you're running a queue off of Postgres, you need to write it to run a queue off of Postgres. You're not just going to lift and shift. So a couple things I would say, um, Redis and Postgres are different. And when you're at scale, you need to make sure that you have a variety of tools. They're both, they both have easily readable code bases. It's easy to understand how they work. Um, typically, um, I find Postgres much easier to manage at scale, but there may be many cases where you might still push something out into Redis. One case where I saw it really helpful in, one, in my career was for authentication tokens on a website. So you have a time to live. That can do a lot of your work for you. It's read seldom, write mostly, and uh, had to be, um, had to be uh, managed in this way. So uh, I've just gone over my recommendations already, and I'm open to questions.
Do we have questions for Chris? So uh, I, I like the things that you mentioned about the, the Postgres cannot handle the, the queues. Uh, so, so can we mix the Postgres with the Redis and let the Redis manage as a queue? Is it is that a good workflow? So, so to make, be absolutely clear here, it's not that you can't build a queue on, on Postgres. I've done it also, right? The issue is that on Redis, you have this uh, list data type where you can just push and pull, right? Um, that doesn't handle persistence very well, so people usually just put it in memory. Um, so for an in-memory queue, yeah, Redis is going to be the easiest thing to do. And I've worked in environments where that's been split off into Redis that's running on the same system even as Postgres. Um, uh, if you're trying to build something that can store more information um, and you don't want to worry about the memory limits or you need persistence, then I probably wouldn't do the queue on Redis. I'd probably do it on Postgres. So. Um, so you mentioned some experience with uh, Oriole DB. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit about sure. some improvements you might see coming? Yeah. So uh, Oriole is uh, what, we're, what we're building is we're building a flash optimized um, storage plugin for for Postgres because uh, the Postgres uh, data table uh, formats uh, was built around the idea that sequential reads are a lot cheaper than um, than random reads. And so, when you start, uh, when you if you start to like try to flash optimize things, um, random I/O is a little cheaper, and you can now start to do things like block level compression, and some other things, um, relatively nicely. So, what I've seen, at least in the benchmarks we've put together, is uh, multiple times the throughput if you're running it on flash storage uh, with transactional workloads. Um, I think. Uh, obviously, it may still have some benefits on um, spinning disks, but those benefits will not include speed. It will probably be slower. Um, I would also say that um, I would also say that um, what else? Uh, like the compression is actually really, really helpful, and that's that's something by itself that that, that, that I'm really excited to see. Uh, well, where is the good place to start to look at how to do queue in Postgres? Uh, so I started a I started a project on GitHub that uh, there are a couple of implementations of this. Um, so uh, there's of course PGQ, which is uh, originally I think part of the Skype tools. Um, that's one that's one possibility. I also wrote uh, a simple implementation called PG Message Queue. It's not for high loads or anything, but it was designed for answering the question of how do I send an email from the database backend, queue it, have something else do it. Um, and then I was working on, I haven't really completed it, but it, it's on GitHub and you can take a look at it. Uh, it's a project that I created called PG Titanides that was based on the work I did on um, a big life sciences database for really, really big heavy queues um, and, and high workloads. And um, uh, I think that that can probably be improved at some point because the code base was built around Postgres 9.4. But uh, um, but but th those would probably be the three things I, I would look at. I would probably start with PGQ because it's the most mature. That's all the time we have today for the.